Today on The Winning Walk with Dr. Ed Young. If your marriage is built upon Jesus Christ, upon his teaching, upon his words, upon his precept, upon him in personal relationship with you, I can tell you, we can stand up when the rains come. It comes in torrents. We can't see our hand in front of our face when we're flooded and we say, boy, it's going to overwhelm us. And then a typhoon comes when it's built on Jesus Christ. It will stand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. The truth is, a strong couple runs from temptation. Welcome to The Winning Walk with Dr. Ed Young. Today, Dr. Young begins a message called, Thou Shalt Flee Temptation Online or Otherwise. He'll open God's Word and share how you can protect your marriage. Now, here's Dr. Ed Young with today's message, Thou Shalt Flee Temptation Online or Otherwise, Part 2. Young Timothy was having a problem with lust. The Apostle Paul wrote him a letter and he said, Timothy, flee youthful lust. He said, what you do when lust comes, you run away from it. And we know that's exactly what Joseph did. The Bible tells us that day after day he was around Mrs. Potiphar and she was Miss Egypt in 02, a knockout, man, a beauty queen, And every day the wife of the person he worked for came by and enticed him to sleep with him. And every day he said no until finally she grabbed Joseph and Joseph ran. So in the Bible you see almost a continuing pattern of the way to escape and flee lust is exactly that. It is to flee, it is to run. And we read our scripture today. What if David, as he walked out on that patio, he couldn't sleep? All the other individuals of that day, all the men had gone off to war, but David, you can see a picture of depression here and despondency and boredom in his life. David the king, he did not go off to war. Instead, he stayed home and he awakened, walked out on the balcony and he looked and there was a beautiful woman, his neighbor's wife, taking a shower. The Bible tells us in the graphic story how he sent for her and slept with her and she came with the news, I am pregnant. And I thought about that. There is David looking with lustful stares at someone of the opposite sex. What is the equivalent of that today? We could talk about all of the men bars that are all around us where we are. You could talk about all these places where businessmen supposedly go to entertain out-of-town guests. That's always the rationale that's used. But I'll tell you something more deadly than that. And that's where the title comes from. Thou shalt flee temptation online and otherwise. Last year, the gross revenue for paid-for content off the Internet in America was $1.4 billion. $1.44 billion. 966 million of that $1.4 billion that was pulled off the Internet and paid for, not the free stuff, was XXX rated for adults only. This means, ladies and gentlemen, that 69% of everything that's paid for, that's taken off the internet, is XXX rated. It is your equivalent, this generation's equivalent, of David peeping and watching this beautiful woman take a shower. I received a letter three weeks ago from a man I'd known for over 15 years. He lives in Florida. In a typewritten letter of several pages, he described to me what he had been going through. He said he was sexually frustrated in his marriage with his wife, having problems communicating with his children. He spent a lot of time on the internet. Before long, he was in those adult chat rooms. Before long, he was involved in all aspects of 
pornographic material. Before long, he was talking to another woman who lived in another state who was going through a difficult time in her marriage. And before long, in the give and take of conversation, they arranged to meet one, one another. They had an affair. He ended up divorcing his wife and leaving his wife and children. She ended up divorcing her husband, leaving her wife and children, and they met and they got married, and they've been married for several months. And he writes to me and says, but I know I have missed God and missed Jesus Christ. What would you advise me to do? I want to get back right with God. Another couple in South Carolina. I remember when they got married and the wedding bells had hardly stopped sounding before she felt that she needed a car like he did. And so they, they bought a second car. And before long, they said, you know, our friends have a new house in this subdivision. And they went out and financed and, and worked out a banking loan and bought a house in a subdivision. Then they bought a refrigerator and a washer and a dryer. And, and you know the rest of the story. And, and they had to go off in spring break. And in two or three years, they were over their head in debt. And they couldn't make those payments. So they went to the bank and consolidated all their debts. They began to make those payments, but the payments kept piling up. They kept charging things. And before long, this young couple went into bankruptcy. And before long, she left him saying, I don't think I can live with someone who is always battling with money and today they're divorced. Florida, South Carolina, two couples, both of them divorced, and I would guess if you looked on those divorce certificates, it said reason for divorce, you'd find one word, incompatibility. Isn't that what's used normally? You know, incompatibility. And that is used in the sense, you know, we just don't get along with one another. But I submit to you that the reason for the divorce of the South Carolina couple and the Florida couple, it was incompatibility, but I want to coin a new phrase here. It was income and patability. The couple in South Carolina, she felt he didn't have enough income. And the guy I knew in Florida felt like his wife didn't have enough patability. And the reason for these two divorces was money and sex, money and sex. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? You trace and study divorce across America, and that represents 40 to 50 percent of the adult, auto, the adult people who are present this morning. And you'll say, yes, it goes back to money, and yes, it goes back to sex. These are the two big reasons. And you put there incompatibility. Sometimes there's not enough income, so they think, and sometimes there's not enough patability, sexual understanding, communication, so they think. So let's drop back and look at these two facets that lead to pressure and harm, that break up relationships and marriage. Well, let, let's look back and look at the money question. And some would say, boy, if we just had more money, J. Paul Getty, familiar name, when he died, his estate was worth over $4 billion. $4 billion. And in his autobiography, which was reported in the L.A. Times, Mr. Getty said, I was never envious of anybody except somebody who had a successful marriage. He said, I was married five times, divorced five times, and I had five failures. And he could have added, every one of his children, their life is a story of unbelievable tragedy and pain. So if you think that all of our problems would be solved if we just had more money and more stuff, the problem is so many of us do not understand money. And to help us to understand money, I want to talk about two words. And the first word is the word stewardship. You say, that's a church word. Oh, no, it's a very realistic word. It is a church word. It is what the Bible teaches us what money is. A lot of people have the idea that everything I have, you know, the tithe, God owns 10% and I own 90%.
That's not the way it is. Everything you have, everything I have, God owns it all. And the concept of stewardship is that God entrusts us with these funds, with this property, with this portfolio, with what we have, great or small, and we are to be trustees of it because he owns it all. That's a biblical understanding of wealth and property. And we have to see that. But we've got that all mixed up because we have put the grasping and the acquisition of stuff ahead even of God, even church people. I read this from some commentator wrote about Mr. and Mrs. Thing. Mr. and Mrs. Thing are a very pleasant and successful couple. At least that's the verdict of most people who tend to measure success with a thingometer. And when the thingometer is put to work in the life of Mr. and Mrs. Thing, the result is startling. There he is sitting down on a luxurious and very expensive thing, almost hidden by the large number of other things, things to sit on, things to sit at, things to cook on, things to eat from, all shiny and new, things, things, things things to wash with, things to uh, clean with, things to clean, things to wash, things to amuse, things to give pleasure, things to watch, things to play, things for the long hot summer, things for the short cold winter, things for the big thing in which they live, things for the garden, things for the lounge, things for the kitchen, things for the bedroom, things on four wheels, things on two wheels, things to put on top of the four wheels, things to pull the four wheels, things to add to the interior of the thing on four wheels, and you give to charitable things, to university things, to political things, and you receive plaques and applause and, and recognition in the world of things. Things, things, things there in the middle are Mr. and Mrs. Things smiling, pleased with themselves, thinking of more things to add to their collection. Security is a castle of things. But I've got news for Mr. Thing. One day you're going to die. And they're going to put you in a box, and in that box is going to be one thing. <laughs> it's you. What does the Bible say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his church, God's agenda, the priorities of Jesus Christ, investment in things that last forever. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all these other things I will add to you. If families and couples here would get their priorities right and really say, from this day forward, we're going to readjust, reschedule, replan, reprogram. We are not going to make this mistake. We're going to put God's things, God's stuff, God in Jesus Christ, number one. And then as we can handle it, I can tell you, he will add these things to our portfolio. Stewardship, God's ownership, man's partnership. And the other word I want to share with you if you're struck in the area of finances and you're married or you're single is the word budget, <laughs> budget. And the budget I like to recommend is called the 10-70-20 budget. Listen to it. You take your total income, what you make, and off the top, you give 10% to God, your pledge to God, to Christ. You're putting first things first. That's the first fruit concept. 10% to God, to his body, to his church. And then you take and you pay all of your taxes, all your taxes out of the first part. And then the amount that you have left, the amount you have left, you take 10% of that and you save it, you invest it. And you take 70% of that and you live on it. That's your operating expenses. That's your house payments. That's clothes and, and food. And that's the rest of it. You live on 70%. You take the last 20% and that's what you pay toward debt. That's the car payment and that's other debts you may have. 10, 70, 20 plan. 
Now, the trick is to live in that 70% in the middle. But if you will take this pattern, if you're single or you're married, I can guarantee you in a handful of years, your life will begin to function. Somebody might say, well, I already have so much debt there. I, the 20% will not handle my debt. What you do is go and consolidate your debts with a banker if you're employed and you have an income and get it where that 20% will handle your debt because the 10, 70, 20 plan will absolutely work. Just a word about budgeting. So if we're having problems in your marriage with money, it's not a question of, oh, we've got too much, we got too little, or we're about right. You have to go and understand stewardship and you have to understand budget, budgeting what you receive. But the other problem, what about the sexual problem in marriage? Somebody says, I need a good manual on, on sexuality in marriage or, uh, you know, uh, my, my, my husband or my wife. And, and we talk about all the give and take in, in, in sexuality here. If you want to read a great book on marriage, I've recommended it many, many times and I, I don't know if anybody pays any attention. All you have to do is read the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is a book on marital intimacy. It is a book on sexual intimacy. It's a fabulous book. And guess what? It's in the Bible. Right in the Scripture. It tells of Solomon and his wife, Shulamite. Uh, you know, these, the biblical women had strange names, Shulamite. I, I'm going to call her Kitty. Uh, that's much better. <laughs> so we have Solomon and Kitty there. And that's what Song of Solomon's all about. It's a beautiful thing. And you know what we find out? We find out some principles about lovemaking between married couples. It's right there in the book. First one I want to tell you, sexual intimacy takes time. Sexual intimacy takes time. In chapter 1, Solomon is describing Kitty while they're engaged. They've just known each other for a while, and he talks about Kitty from her head up. Okay, that's all he could see. The rest of her body was covered. He talks about her, her eyes and her nose and her hair and her ears, and he talks about her from her head up. Chapter 1. Chapter number 4, they'd been married for a while. They'd been on their honeymoon. They'd come back. Now he talks about Kitty. He talks about her hair and her eyes and her breast. They, they, it's, they've had some time together. Chapter 7, they'd been through some crises together and some problems together. They'd been married for a period of time. And in chapter 7, he talks about Kitty from the top of her head, from the bottom of her feet. He has spent time with Kitty, and Kitty has spent time with Solomon. Sexual intimacy takes time. It takes time. Also, sexual intimacy takes good timing. Oh, yeah. You read in chapter 5, Solomon one morning was feeling sort of lovey-dovey, and he went into his wife uh, Kitty, Shulamite, if you want to call her that, went into Kitty and, and you know, he made some amorous uh, moves and, and Kitty said, I oh, know, it's early. I, I'm, I'm not interested in anything like that. And it, it, we're familiar with that. It's like the, the guy I read about, he said he came home one night and he walked in the door and he handed his wife to Anison. And she said, <laughs> she said, I don't have a headache. He said, gotcha. <laughs> And you see, sexual intimacy takes timing. It takes good timing. Not only does it take time, it takes good timing. And Solomon, you know, he missed the time. He forgot to look at the sundial and see about Kitty. And, and so he gets mad, typical male, and he walks away, but an hour or so goes by and Kitty says, Boy, you know, I'd like to express love to, to Solomon myself. And so she goes out looking for him. You say it takes good timing. Also, sexual intimacy takes timely communication. All the way through the book of Psalm, Psalm, so I'm going to read it. Man, he is talking about her. She's talking about him. I mean, they're, they're together. They have their own code words. They're, they're amorous. They're intimate. They're loving. They're, they're like a constant honeymoon, and there's joy and 
and, and excitement and teasing in their relationship. Read the book. It takes timely communication. The word intercourse, for example, it means to, to go back. We talk about verbal intercourse, and we, we use it in this context. There is communication between two people. And in marriage, there is a beautiful intimacy, the sacred intimacy that God has given. And we in the church have missed this. On one side of the church, we say, nothing goes. The other side of the church, we say, everything goes. And somewhere in the middle is the biblical principle of how a husband and wife express love to one another. So sexual intimacy, Song of Solomon tells us, it takes time. It takes time. It takes good timing. It takes timely communication. And finally, it takes time away with pressure, with vocation, with work, with children, and all of this. A couple needs to spend time away. You see that in chapter 7. You see Solomon and Kitty planning to go away together, and they talk about the gardens they're going to see, the waterfalls they're going to experience, the art that's going to be. They talk about intimate things about being together in time away. Can you get better counsel than that as far as human sexuality and marriage? You take someone who follows the principles of Song of Solomon, I can tell you the physical problem will not be your problem in your marriage. Biblical counsel, biblical counsel, clearly taught in the Word of God. So we talk about money, we talk about sex. But here is one marriage and all the pressures of culture attack this one marriage and the marriage stands. The same pressures of culture attack another marriage and the marriage fails. What's the difference? How can this marriage make it and this marriage not make it? What's the difference? Take your Bible and turn with me the gospel according to Luke. And Jesus tells us clearly the difference. Luke chapter number 6, verse 46 following, listen. Jesus is speaking. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts upon them will show you whom he is like. Verse 48, he is like a man building a house, a home, a marriage, who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when the flood rose and the torrent burst against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and who has acted accordingly is like a man who built a house upon the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. Here is a house, a home, a marriage. We could say it collapsed. Here's another one who stood. And the same rain fell upon both houses. And the same flood came on both houses. The same torrential winds, the hurricanes came on both houses. One house stood, one house fell. One marriage stood, one marriage fell. What's the difference? Jesus would say it's the foundation. It's the foundation. Now we better ask the question, what are some of the things that are blowing against marriage today? What is some of the pressures that are coming against marriage at this moment in history? What are some of these? First of all, I think we have to have to say the environment in which we live, the culture in which God has put you and God had put me, I think all of us agree. How many of you today think that being married today is tougher than it was 20 years ago? Would you lift your hand? You think it being married is tougher than it was 20 years ago? I mean, anybody who didn't raise their hand, I, don't, I worry about you. I can tell you, I guarantee you it's tougher. Because I can tell you the currents that are blowing, the rain that's falling on marriage today is contrary to anything we've ever seen before. And, and there seems to be nothing valid about being married any longer. George Gallup has written an interesting book. That's Gallup Poll. It's called Forecast 2000. And in this book, he lists some things 
that he believes are coming against marriage in our culture, that are attacking family in our culture. It is a result of a national survey. And he talks specifically about things that are bombarding our culture and seek to break up understanding. And there's a whole horde of those things. We can list them, but Gallup listed them in order of their importance. And he says, this is what is destroying the family. This is what is hurting the children. This is what is breaking up marriages in our culture everywhere today. And the first thing he lists is alternative lifestyles. And alternative lifestyles. Today, there's an argument about what is marriage. And they have that phrase that's an oxymoron, you know, same-sex marriage. That's not marriage. That is supposedly trying to be licensed illegality. And you have a a battle here everywhere in the courts, in every state in this land, and in federal statutes concerning what is marriage. There's alternative lifestyles. More people are living together who are not married than ever before. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Just from a sociological perspective, not just a theological perspective, I can tell you those who live together First of all, few of them get married, and those who do get married, the chances of divorce are infinitely higher than those who never lived together before they are married. So we have alternative lifestyles, Mr. Gallup says, is a real problem for marriage and for the family today. The other one, he says, is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is attacking the family. I challenge you in the last five years to name a time on television or a time in the media in which you've seen a husband and wife go to bed together. Since you have seen a happily married couple who love one another and experience intimate lovemaking, you can't find it on television, you can't find it in the media. What you find instead are those who are unmarried going to bed together or those who are married to somebody else going to bed together. And so we have a whole culture that is breeding and spreading sexual immorality. That's where we live, and it's attacking the institution of marriage and the family and and, and the integrity of the home. We have to go back and ask the question, why did God give us sex? God created it. Madonna didn't invent sex. God created it. He created it for pleasure. He created it for procreation. He created it for protection, the Bible teaches us. And therefore, we see we live in a culture and a climate of sexual immorality. And therefore, what is attacking the home? Gallup would say the environment in which we live. And he would list these two things that I have talked about. And then he would come and say the third thing he lists is Financial pressure, financial pressure. I want to keep up with the Joneses. And we get in trouble with plastic. We just put down plastic. I have have a friend who's who's wrestled with with debt for a long, long time. And, And recently he told me what has brought me out of the entrapment of debt and payment on all my credit cards is now I pay only cash. He said, it's something about taking cash and putting the dollars down, the dimes down, the money down when you buy something. He said, this really helps instead of just putting down a piece of plastic. If you're having trouble, any kind of trouble with debts and payments, tear up all the plastic. That's a good way to begin to economize because you realize actually what something costs when you begin to put the money down. Tear up the plastic. And so financial pressure, another thing Mr. Gallup said is attacking marriage and attacking family and attacking the home. Another thing he mentions is radical feminism. Radical feminism, the feminist movement. And I, he couldn't put down radical chauvinism because they're the same thing. What is a radical feminist, a radical chauvinist? It's a man or a woman who says the most important thing is for me to fulfill myself. It's not the duet that I've given with my mate 
and with God, which would be a trio. It's not the covenant marriage. It's I want to fulfill my desires. I want to fulfill my destiny. I want to do my thing. And by me doing my own thing, it's more important than whatever my mate has. And we have forgotten the very, forgotten the very basic thing that God says when marriage takes place, there's one plus one equals one. Two become one flesh. Two become one flesh. And we see the environment in which we live is a thing that is attacking the institution, the sacred, holy institution of marriage. And what's something else that attacks the institution? It is tough times. These are external forces that attack us. Tough times come. And that's the part of the givenness of life. There will be sickness. There will be death. There will be problem with children. There will be vocational problems. There will be geographical problems. Tough times come to all of us. And we have the idea, well, I'm really surprised this is happening. I I just can't imagine this. It's a part of the agenda of life. You know, I, I was talking to my son, Ben, this past week. He said, boy, I've had a really bad day. I said, what happened, Ben? He said, well, you know, I already had a tire that had a flat tire, and I went, and I went to get in the trunk, and my, my spare was flat, and I had two flat tires. He said, well, I called AA, and, and, and I, I had to run out with AA eight days ago. And he said, I got home, and Claire was sick with high fever, and he went on and through. You know, tough times, however they come, in small packages in a daily variety, but in big things that happen, this is a part of that which attacks marriage and the family. Tough times, we all go through them. When I was going through sports in high school, I think every locker room I ever went in had the same thing on it. You remember? When the going gets tough, while the tough get going. And I, our coach would always say, all right, guys, when the going gets tough, and he'd talk about tough going, and the tough gets going. But you know that's true. What happens? What do we do in tough times? I'll tell you what we do. We go back and we talk about commitment. That's what love is. It's commitment. And there comes a time all of us would say, my marriage has not been happy. Anybody would say, my marriage is happy all the time. I don't believe it. There are times that we're unhappy in our marriage. Tough times come. The culture pushes in around us. The crises are more than we can stand. And you're not happy. That's when we have to say, but I am committed. I am in a covenant relationship. So tough times attack marriage. They, They really do. Also change. The winds of change. And by the way, this is symbolism Jesus used here. We could say the rain is the culture. We should say tough times, the the, the crises that comes, that would be the flood. And we would say, finally, you move on through that, it would be not only the flood, that would be the strong winds that's blowing. By the way, you know the greatest natural disaster in history? It happened in 1887 when the Yellow River in China flooded and over seven million lives were lost. But I can tell you in the flood that's overwhelming many marriages, and there's some here today, you may say, I'm just hanging on. I'm just, I barely have my nose above water in my own marriage for various reasons, various pressures that come. But I can tell you when rains come and the flood comes, And change comes. We're we're surprised at change. Let me shock you. When you're married without children, you have one kind of lifestyle. And you're married and you have little children, you have another kind of lifestyle. And when those little children become teenagers, Ed, you'll have another kind of lifestyle. (laughs) Yeah. And when they leave and go off to college and you have empty nests, You have another kind of lifestyle. (laughs) And they're all great. We change. We change physically. We change in relationships. We change in business. We change a lot of things. Change is a part of life, but it's a part of things that tend to deteriorate the relationship between a man and his wife. 
Now we come to the bottom line question, the big one. What if you've got to the point that you've just run out of bullets and like in the words of Jesus here, your marriage is collapsing or you may feel your marriage has collapsed or your marriage is dead and you don't know what to do. You, there's no one, nothing anybody you know can do to help you and there's nothing you can do to help yourself. What do you do in this kind of situation? In the SOS situation of marriage, what do you do? You turn to Isaiah chapter number 43, that's what you do. And you'd better turn to it because you're going to need it if you don't need it today. Isaiah chapter 43, a tremendous chapter. Psalm, Proverbs, please ask the Song of Solomon, Isaiah. It's right there in the middle, turn right. Isaiah 43, but now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. First of all, it says, do not fear, but I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. What does this say? It says, relax. If you've bottomed out in your marriage, relax. You're in God's plan. If you have been redeemed and you know Jesus Christ, you're in God's plan. Relax. You're in his plan. He says, fear not. You know how many times the phrase fear not is found in the Bible? 365 times. One fear not for every day of the week. Fear not. He says, I know your name. I know your social security number. I know how many hairs on the top of your head. He says, I know your house number. I know your tag number. I know your dog tag number. I know everything about you. Relax. You're in God's plan. I know your name, your mind. That's what he says. If you're bottling out, say, you're in God's plan. You know what you're going to discover about God's plan? God's plan, though we may not see it in this life, though we may, it is more important and it is doing something that's greater than any problems you might have as you live in his plan. So the first thing, relax. Cool it. Fear not, you're in God's plan. You're his, you belong to him. Look at the next thing it tells us when we're being overcome by rain and flood and by wind. Verse two, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I will be with you. God's presence. You can just feel God's presence. If you'll be still in the middle of the turbulence that's around your life, you can feel the presence of God. He's there with you. That, that's his promise. That's his word. You're in God's plan. Cool it. Fear not. You have God's presence. I will be with you. And then finally, he says, you have God's protection. Look at the latter part of this. Latter part of verse 3. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. You have God's protection. But you know, I don't like one word there. In fact, two words I don't like. I don't like the word through. He says, you know, I'll go with you through the river, through the flood, through the fire. I wish you'd say, go around the river, around the flood, around the fire. I mean, we, we, we get in deep water. You don't know what I have to face. You don't know what you have to live with. You don't know what we're going through. We don't know all the health problems. We don't know all the challenges. We don't know all the, 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 the sexual things and all of this that go into the financial things in marriage. Man, I, I got to go through. Can I go under or about? No, you go through. I don't like that word through, but it's there. And then another word I don't like, it says you walk we're to run away from temptation, but we walk through the rain and the flood and the typhoon. You walk in our hot coals. It said you won't be, I mean, I'll run through hot coals, but let me run. I don't want to walk. I don't want to walk. You mean I've got to walk through this for a month, a year, five years? years? Walk. Walk. But as we walk through, through, he says, you're in my plan. Relax. Relax. 
You have my presence. I'm with you every step of the way. And my purpose is greater than whatever is going on. And you have my protection. You have my protection. And your marriage will give glory to God. It will be a blessing to you and a blessing to me. Now, what do we say is the test of whether or not we're going to make it, whether or not the house stands against all the turbulence of environment, of culture, of tough times, of crises, all the things that come our way as we change along the walk through life, what is going to be the test as to whether or not your marriage or my marriage is successful, whether or not it fails? What's, what's going to be the difference? The foundation. And look at the, the corollary verse to this. Look over you would in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 10. Listen. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, 1 Corinthians 3, 10. As a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. If your marriage is built upon Jesus Christ, upon his teaching, upon his words, upon his precept, upon him in personal relationship with you, I can tell you, we can stand up when the rains come. It comes in torrents. We can't see our hand in front of our face when we're flooded and we say, boy, it's going to overwhelm us. And then a typhoon comes when it's built on Jesus Christ. It will stand. Your marriage is successful. Or your marriage is, the desi is a disaster. It collapses or it stands. The determining factor, the determining factor, the foundation, the foundation. Well, before we leave you today, Dr. Young is here to answer a couple of questions coming out of the message we've just heard. The Ten Commandments of Marriage, as we look at one of the toughest pressures marriages face today, and that is temptation. And Dr. Young, it is everywhere. It's online. It's everywhere, isn't it? It really is, Wayne. And I keep repeating over and over again what the Bible does. We run from temptation. And sometimes I think we are vulnerable to old Slewfoot bringing us down when we're at the wrong place, the wrong time, what we read, where we go, what we see, all the input around us. We get enough from billboards and commercials and Super Bowl games to just destroy uh, someone's faith and destroy their marriage. So how important it is that we have fun with our brides, we, we keep a high outlook on kingdom stuff, and we Make sure that we have the right friends, which is all important, and certainly we have a Bible-believing church, which is of vital importance, and certainly we have a home that is unapologetically Christ-centered and is a fun place to be. Hmm. You put those things up around your life and my life, Wayne, and all the allurements of the world just don't have any appeal. All right. Thank you, Dr. Young. You've been listening to The Winning Walk with Dr. Ed Young. We hope today's message has encouraged you to build your life on the proven truth of God's Word. Winning Walk is a listener-supported ministry. Your prayers and financial support allow us to bring proven truth to listeners around the world. Connect with us at winningwalk.org. That's winningwalk.org.